Hey, it's Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And you're watching another episode of the M Squared TechCast, MITechNews.tv. Uh, and we are about to let our uh, favorite uh, coronavirus expert, Fred Brown, um, become the journalist today. And he's going to do an interview, or at least be in charge of it. Mike and I'll probably pipe in with a few questions. Yes. But uh, Fred, Fred, go ahead, take it away and introduce your guest. I'd like to introduce uh, Chris, Chris Matter. Robert, Chris, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, we're, uh, Chris has some great uh, new thoughts about how to contact Trace. And as you know, you know, there's sort of the, the three W's in the four corners. The three W's are hand washing. So W1 is washing. Number two is, uh, is, um, uh, is watch how far away you are. So that's the distance part. And uh, number three uh, uh, of the W's is to, uh, uh, is, is to uh, make sure that you do, um, let's see. The hygiene part, we got the hygiene part, we got the hand washing part, and we've got the distance part. So we have to wash, wash your hands. That's the third W. And we talk about four corners of a box, we try to box the coronavirus in. One is tracing, I'm uh, sorry, first is testing, second is tracing, the third is isolating, and the fourth is quarantining. And Chris has some great tools on how to box in coronavirus. So we wanted to kind of talk about how to talk out of how to box in coronavirus in the terms of testing, tracing, and uh, and then isolating and, and, and quarantining. So Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about you know some of the modeling that you're doing and some of the some of the tools you have? Sure. Thank you, Fred, for having me today. I, I appreciate the invite. Um, happy uh, happy to discuss. Uh, you know, kind of what we're doing and, and my, uh, my thoughts on contact tracing, you know, sort of we're evolving, right? We're evolving since this pandemic hit, we are absolutely evolving into the next phase, which is testing and recovery, two phases, right? Yes. And so on the recovery side, um, there's a lot of mis misinterpretation, not enough education. Um, and how do we do that? Right. We've heard a lot of stories about, you know, how the government is hiring this army of contact tracers that ultimately will, you know, call people up and, you know, try to trace these, these people down that are ultimately testing positive. Um, that's, in, that's, a, that's a good effort. Um, I don't think it's quite effective. Um, and so what we do is we have a, a new technology. It's actually an old technology. It's older. Um, but we kind of pivoted and now apply it to contact tracing. So we initially created it for the opioid epidemic, and now we, uh, uh, we use it for, um, you know, uh, tracing uh, positively uh, tested COVID-19 patients for people. So let's talk a little bit about, about tracing, because uh, um, it's really critical. And what's one of the areas where the U.S. Uh, has a chance to learn from what some of the other countries are doing? And what we found so far, as I understand it, Chris, and correct me if I'm wrong, we've got kind of two big... Uh, technologies. The first big technology we've got is basically GPS. We look at where people are building, uh, whether they're coming to the same building, whether they're congregating, and places like China and Taiwan is using a GPS-based system. And that, that has some limitations because you don't know what floor the person is on in a crowded environment, and you don't really know whether the people have, got, have gotten that close together, really. Uh, and then the second one is a little bit more uh, of, a, of a advanced technology, which is token work. And basically, when your Bluetooth gets close enough to another phone uh, within six feet, uh, that you take a reading of that other person's token, and you know that you've been in contact within sufficient contact of that person uh, uh, at that at that particular point in time. And then you can kind of judge whether or not you're getting symptoms at the right period of time, and whether you need to go get tested. And those are the two kind of big. Uh, competing tests, and interestingly, Britain uh, just decided to move uh, to a less complicated one from a more complicated one, uh, which is sort of an interesting decision. They were making two tests, two contact tracing at, at once. One was to do with a with a centralized version, and the other was to do with a decentralized version. What's interesting about your test is that it's it's more centralized, but it's uh, designed to do things at a much more precise level. As I understand it, right? It is correct. Um, so. Uh, let, let's just address the, the feasibility, right? So um, basically for contact tracing from a tech perspective, we integrate both GPS and Bluetooth. So we integrate GPS and near field technology. Um, and then let's go one step further. For it to be effective, you have to really have 60% or more opt-in, meaning user interface. And if you don't have that, it will not be effective. 
So our model, actually, what we've decided to do is we have embraced the enterprise model. So unlike, you know, government just pushing this out and hoping that, you know, 325 million people in the United States will actually use this, which I doubt. <laughs> um, we have decided to deploy this on an enterprise level through a free market approach, which means that we are going after universities, we are targeting universities, hospital systems, you know, just general businesses as they come back, you know, to embrace their student population, their employees, their patient populations, you know, to, to really educate them as they come back to the workspace or the university. And that will uh, actually result in about 100% user interface. And, you know, I think, I think that's a brilliant idea because if you think about what happened, the government sort of said, okay, we're all going to shut down now. And actually what happened was people already had shut down. <laughs> By the time the government said, well, let's shut down, they'd already shut down. So that wasn't the issue. The issue was each individual wants to, you know, looks at his own risk, his or her own risk level and says, I'm, I'm not going to do this activity anymore. What's nice about what you've done is work activities are about a third of what we do with our lives, uh, for example, in the university uh, setting, it's almost 24 hours a day, what you do with, you're doing with your life. So um, what you've done is you sort of said, you know, you've taken that part of the, of our life that says, this is a really important part of the, our, our, our lives. And it could be either the safest thing we do every day or the least safe thing we do every day with regard to coronavirus. This is one of the things that's going to make it one of the safest places to be with coronavirus. And that, that, that excites me. Yeah, that I, I, it's funny because, you know, if you Americans are very fickle, they love their they love their liberty. Right. So <laughs> don't, don't, don't tell me what to do. However, if if an employer says or a university says, listen, you need to embrace this to make money or come back to a university, then it's a risk reward element. Right. It's it's really that easy. And, and it's informed consent. You know what you're getting yourself into. You understand the risk. You're, so the, and it's, it's very capitalistic, which is very aligned with what we're doing. And if you look at what happened with Iowa, for example, they, I'm sorry, Idaho, they, was it, no, uh, Utah. Utah tried to come out with a tracing system. I think 1% of the people in the state signed up for it. And of course, you only have 1%, you know, hitting 1%. That's 0.1% of a chance, 0.1% of a chance that you actually get a contact and a trace yeah. uh, among, among uh, the people who are using the system. So that, so I think your system sounds really exciting from a terms of acceptability standpoint. Tell us a little bit about what it can do. So um, it's really, um, it, it really focuses on two levels. Uh, the, the first level is really addressing, um, really addressing, uh, you know, an app and the user interface. So this part we actually created for the CDC. Um, so it's, it's very well tested and proven. Um, and this is where we have the heat map, right? It's, it's extremely educational, right? So you have a heat map of total uh, COVID pace, uh, uh, COVID-19 cases. Um, and we scrape that through Johns Hopkins and pub other public, you know, entities. Um, and then, then, you know, there's news feeds on it. And then I, then it gets a little more juicy and fun where there's a chat bot element. And the chat bot element is really cool because that's where, again, if you sort of take the university, uh, uh, scenario. You know, you have students that would ask basic questions. Hey, I'm going to be coming back in September. I'm from this area. Um, you know, I'm coming from this area. Could be a hot spot, right? Um, you know, what do I do to get into my dorm? How do I do? Are, are we going to have football games? You know, all the, all the basic questions. And so the beauty of that is um, it, it frees up resources from the university side that people aren't on the fall, phone, call, you know, talking to the kids all the time. You can just, it just automatically responds because of AI intervention. Sounds like something that LTU might be interested in there. What do you think, Matt? <laughs> That's a possibility for sure. We, uh, we have announced that we're going to bring students back uh, in, for the fall semester that's supposed to start August 24th, but the exact form of what that's going to take is still being worked on and depends on events between now and then, you know, so <clears throat> most of our classes are small. Anyway, we have a reputation for small class sizes and, you know, keeping social distance in a class with 12 people is a heck of a lot easier than a four person lecture. So, you know, well, let's take that example. Cause you know, maybe the guy, maybe the students all want to get together at the, at the bar, 
after the class, you know, and kind of talk things through. And they don't, and so, but, you know, they're, they're, they're using your system. And, uh, and what's the difference between today where they walk into the bar and not really sure about, about the situation versus when they're using that system and they come out of the bar and LTU can kind of look at what's happened and, and, and give a sense of, what's, of what the risks are that now have, have, have occurred. Can you tell yes. us about that model? Yes. Yeah, so I, I think uh, it's, it's, again, it's about not knowing and knowing, right? You yeah. know, right now nobody knows, right? So, and, and you want to, you want to alleviate that. So basically what would happen is uh, I'll just kind of take you through the process on some of the universities that we're currently working with. So yeah. basically what's happening is the, all the universities would require the students to, ha to have a baseline. The baseline would be that they have to have, they have to be tested for COVID. If they test positive, then they quarantine 15 days. If they test negative, then they can come into the university per usual. But they must, they, but they must opt in on the app, okay? Yeah. That's key. Perfect. Once they opt in, then we know where they are. We know where, we're, where they're coming from. It's not intrusive. It's, it's all HIPAA requirements and everything else. There's no, nothing related to, and it's all security. So then they, they come to school and they're asking basic questions, but because of our AI technology, we're capturing all that data. Right. And that's really important as it relates to the administration and the leaders, because AI, we can then push information out based upon strategy, right? So we can see if there's, if there's, a, big, um, uh, if there's a big influx of students coming from a, a, a hotspot, let's just say it's Detroit, right? Yeah. Um, they're going to MSU. Um, we can identify, okay, we have uh, a thousand students coming uh, this such day, um, coming to MSU. We need to put them in a specific dorm because they could be tested positive, right? And so the, these, this all is effective with strategy. Yeah. And we have graphs that, that absolutely in, integrate AI and machine learning in the process. Then I'll go one step further, Fred. So, so, so basically what would happen is there, this, the university would conduct serial testing throughout the semester because they have to, because you could get, you know, positive. But ultimately the, the future would be, we would integrate like sort of red and green dots with QR codes, go back to your point with near field technology. So that little Johnny, if he's got a red, he can't get into the fraternity party because there's a re there's a receiver, right? And it's he's got red. Whereas you know Sarah, Sally can get in, right? Because she's got green. It's the, really that simple. Yeah. So you're you're looking at all the different uh, kind of uh, indicators. Uh, and you're integrating those together and then looking at the individual and seeing what that behavior has been with those factors in the environment and then saying, yep, it looks like you've been pretty safe in the past uh, 14 days. You've got a green signal and then you've got a red signal say, you know, you better uh, hold back and, and, and what, do, do, take your classes remotely in the case of LTU, for example. Yeah. And, and, and what's really good is you guys remember from uh, when this first started out in New York, remember the New Rochelle breakout? Right. And and they couldn't find the guy for 30 days, right? This can identify real fast, 24 to 48 hours, heats, you know, really, really important hotspots, you know, where there's a breakout. And we can identify that and then track it. And you know, for the audience, they, they may not realize how much better the United States has gotten in testing. Uh, when we first, uh, our first COVID uh, uh, patient was January 26th. And, the, and we know that. And then it took us uh, all the way until about March 15th or so, so almost three months, to test the first 20,000 people. Today, we do 20,000 every day. Yep. And we'll do 40,000 every day by September. So you get a sense of just how powerful your technology like yours can be, Chris, when you have all the other sen sensitivities, all the other signals uh, coming through plus uh, a viable test and a viable recent test. So I, I think uh, we're, get, we're getting there, but, uh, we're sure, you know, so, but we need to accelerate, there's no doubt. The, the, uh, and it's funny, the, it's funny because the biggest challenge that we are facing right now, uh, especially like you say, the university, right? The universities is that they're moving too slow 
But, you know, what we tell them is, you know, don't, don't worry about the civil liberties. That's not your biggest issue. Worry about the legal cases if somebody gets uh, sick on your watch. Yeah. You know, if, uh, if mom and dad are sending little Johnny off in a, to a safe environment and you're not providing that, you know, be very, very careful of that. Yeah, you know, when you take yeah, Let me uh, interject. I think sorry, that, uh, I guess you ran some scenarios. Fred gave you some scenarios. And uh, your folks gather in a group as they are wont to do these days. What sort of impact that would have? Why don't we get into some of those? It, yeah, I'm not sure if you have slides or graphics or what you have. Yeah. Um, so what we did was, uh, so we took um, we uh, took the state of basically, like I said, we scraped data from uh, basic you know public databases like uh, you know Johns Hopkins, which reports it every day, and we scrape it in, in this real time data. And then from there, what we do is we do some overlapping. Um, based upon counties in Michigan. I did it for Michigan, guys. And so what we found was actually kind of uh, amazing. So, uh, so for example, um, we found that we did one with unemployment rate. Uh, so what we found, um, you know, in Wayne County, so Wayne County has a, the largest uh, number of COVID uh, COVID. Uh, 19 positive testing, right? But one of the other areas that was very high based upon unemployment rate was uh, Genesee. Um, and that was, uh, that was kind of amazing to me, um, but it didn't, it, obviously it's not comparable to Wayne, but it had a very high level of um, uh, COVID-19 patients associated with unemployment rate. We did, um, I'll go a little step further. Uh, so, um, you can share your screen if you want. Yeah. So, well, you, you want me to, sh you you want want to share it? Yes. Your little green box on the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, share a screen. I got it. I got it. Get in there. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is models start off being being statistical and eventually they become mechanistic, which means we, we move from a, a situation where you're a, a probable answer, a probabilistic answer, to one where you can say, you know, given this, this, and this input, here's what the answer is. And models slowly evolve. And Chris is on the cutting edge here where we're getting to a point where we're getting some answers rather than just, well, statistically, you fall into this class. We're actually getting some, okay, you didn't have a mask. You were an LTU student. You uh, attended these classes. You went to this bar. All of a sudden, you start to get a much more precise kind of sense of what, what the level of risk is. Hmm. If that makes sense. Rather than just saying, well, you're part of this, <laughs> this cohort. Yeah, it looks like you've got a 30% chance. <laughs> Plus or minus 10%. Oh, you yeah. guys can see that? Beautiful. Yes. Awesome. Okay, so basically, so this represents what I what we do is we, as I said, we currently scrape data uh, based on Johns Hopkins and other uh, public databases uh, that report COVID nineteen cases, uh, and then it goes to states. and And again, we have an app that that uh, offers users the same kind of information. And then what I did was um, we went back and then we went to specific counties. So obviously like the Wayne County is, is the, you can see here, uh, most uh, affected counties. Uh, then it goes to Oakland and Macomb, right? Yeah. Um, then it, you know, you know, just basic information, right? So I'm gonna skip down to the good part. Uh, so, so for example, we have machine learning that, it, that integrates not only based upon testing, but also other algorithms that for, so this one indicates that by August uh, 2nd, we're gonna have Michigan will have uh, a, a very large um, uh, increase in the number of cases. It's close to 100,000. Well, uh, up from 67,000 a day. Yeah, and yeah. What's, what's interesting is it looks like we're kind of Going, going slow, slowly, slowly. What's nice about these models is that it actually starts to talk about, you know, look at the exponential growth opportunities. When we look at R right now, our R, our reproductive rate in Michigan, uh, was well below one for the la uh, through May. But uh, when we started to turn the corner and open things up, it's now well over one. 
uh, and it's in fact, we're in danger of, of having a, a big, big, big outbreak uh, in, in, in a few months. And, 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 and what's, what's also, um, you know, important is that this, you know, this graph or this, in, this uh, model does not only, you know, represent number of tests. That's easy, right? That's, it's much more comprehensive and it actually includes some of this information, which is median income, most affected areas, um, weather hum and humi humidity correlation, which is uh, pretty amazing. Um, you know, if you look at the, you know, incidents here and the incidents here, of course, Wayne County is uh, one of the biggest um, and uh, related to other, other markets. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty compelling. So, um, this is what I was talking about before the unemployment rate. Oh, so so for, for people who are, who are on the audience, Wayne is, Wayne is basically Detroit, Oakland's a Detroit suburb, uh, Macomb's Detroit suburb, Kent is, uh, Grand Rapids, you get Tennessee is Flint and so on. So you get a sense of where we are in the state, Kalamazoo is Kalamazoo, uh, but I'm sorry, keep going. No, that's okay. So, and and I and Fred, I you know chime in because you're more familiar with the counties than I am. So, uh, uh, so I'm because I'm based in New York area. Um, but the so like for example here, Genesee, you can see the unemployment rate in and then the most affected areas and correlating that right. You're looking at nine point almost ten percent of unemployment with confirmed cases. Versus this, the correlation and the ratio is actually quite high, <laughs> and that that is compelling. So, so really, what does that mean? It means for government officials or our leaders that perhaps some of these things have a lot to do with the spread, right? So it's not only you know um, uh, you know being close to one another. Like we did one graph that was related to broadband, and you if you go to you know the the here, this one. If you if you think about you know the uh, the issue of access to the internet, you know, and access to education and and information, um, you know, broadband uh, penetration and the correlation for most affected areas, um, there is a there's a direct correlation to affected areas and lack of broadband. Yeah, of course, cor correlation and causation uh, is is not necessarily causation, but we're finding more and more is that when you add the AI components in, you're able to you know, actually zero, zoom in on individuals and, and enterprises, then you can start to actually find the, the causation. And we are finding that, in, especially in rural communities uh, and, and, and poor mi and minority communities, they're having a, a you know, there is actually a causation uh, effect that we're starting to find with the feedback loops we're having. Absolutely. And so these are the, so these are the, to me, these are, this is sort of goes back to our, you know, original conversation, right? For contact tracing, right? And if you wanna make phone calls, that's great, but you need these tools. We can easily integrate these tools to complement overall contact tracing so that we are successful and that we are extremely knowledgeable in how we, how we do this and, and our leaders, uh, you know, the university presidents, the CEOs, as they, re as we go through this, this next phase of recovery and bring students and, and employees back and follow patient populations, because there will be spikes, um, you know, how do we do this? How do we maintain the relationship? Um, and, and that's, that's really important. And, and I'll, I'll give an example, like in New York, I'm not going to name names, but, you know, we're dealing with a couple of hospital systems. Obviously, New York was hit hard. Um, we had we had uh, surgeons that uh, because, you know, they couldn't uh, practice, they couldn't do surgery. Um, they were actually part of the contact tracing army on behalf of hospital systems. Now, just think about that. You have a surgeon that is making phone calls following up with a general patient that is basically saying, hey, how are you feeling? Okay, that's absolutely underemployed. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and you know, in Michigan, we're trying to actually. Gretchen, uh, uh, Gretchen Mushmore has a our, our governor has a program where we're trying to recruit uh, volunteers, and we're trying to recruit twenty two hundred volunteers in Michigan. But when you get up to one hundred thousand cases, you can imagine each of those people who are confirmed cases are probably going to 
have contact with between six and 20 more people, all of a sudden your contact tracing operations get completely overwhelmed, right? You can't, you just can't follow up that much that, on that many and you can't make good diary notes. And then at that point, really sadly, the, some of the value uh, uh, of contact tracing subsides with, with the augmentation of machine learning and computers, we can really do a great job with it, uh, even with a smaller number of people. So that's the exciting part. I think you're right, especially with the- We're, We are generating enormous traction uh, especially with hospital systems and universities, because we feel it's our duty to help. And so what we've decided to do is defer initial costs associated with this, with the actual deployment, because they shouldn't be worried about costs initially. We'll, you know, we'll take that on. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a freemium model because we feel very strongly that this, you know, America needs to get back to work. America needs to get back to some sense of normalcy and it has, it must integrate, you know, it's sort of this, this AI integration to be very, very safe and effective. And so this is an inexpensive, relatively, and, and a very quite accurate uh, way of letting us open up with some knowledge. You know, it's so, so often it's just a, uh, a ham-fisted approach is we're going to shut down the whole economy or open it all up. By going enterprise to enterprise, person to person, you're really getting down to the level that you need to to open up, you know, wisely uh, and, and 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 inexpensively. I think it's great. Let me, let me leave in here. One of the things that we were discussed a while back was whether or not the outside temperature had any impact on reducing the virus. And I don't. Does it? Do we know that? So, do you guys see this graph? Yeah. So weather and humidity correlation for most affected areas, right? So mm -hmm. temperature and humidity, right? Yeah. So look at Wayne. So the temperature was close to 80 degrees, right? Humidity is low again. So, so to answer your question, um, it does. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, one of the things that we, here's, here's what we do know about, Medical protocol, and we, this needs, again, more research needs to be done. It's a very good question. Medical protocol right now, we have none. All we have is, is go quarantine for 15 days. That's it. So we don't know. We have no idea if, you know, weather or humidity has a dramatic effect on it, you know, definitively from a research perspective. We don't, we don't know if 15 days is good enough. We don't know if you're immune after 15 days or you're still, uh, you know, uh, passing on the illness. We, have, we, don't, we don't have any of this information. And the, that's unfortunate. The biggest thing we're worried about in the fall, just so people understand about the weather, is that as things get cold, uh, colder, people start to get back inside more. And that really is highly correlated with, uh, with, with, uh, with advanced pr progression of the disease. So that's why we're so worried about what's going to happen with the flu season. Okay, we've only got about a minute left. So Chris, uh, we, we do roll. We give you a half an hour this time, Fred. It's just, I know, I'm overwhelmed. Well, it's a great job with that, Chris. I really appreciate the time. And these kind of tools and techniques, as people get more familiar with them, I think they, don't, they become part of life. And you get more, and you get happier with integrating that, that part of life uh, without really thinking about it. And eventually this will become part of life uh, as, we, as we get better with this. So I, and it's great that you're, you're on the front end, Fred, Ed, Fred Ed here. Well, so if, if people want more information on this, uh, Christopher, how do they get a hold of you or Fred? Uh, so for me, um, they can, it's, should I give my email? Should I just oh, give yeah, sure. you that address? Okay. You are, you know? okay. So it's cm at ga ventures, cm at ga ventures dot co. It's the best way. And I'm, and I'm Fred dot brown dot covid uh, at gmail.com. Traditional four-year students love Lawrence Technological University's thriving campus life, but LTU has always met non-traditional students' needs, too. Lawrence Tech offers over 100 degree and certificate programs that can get adult students started or back on track. And most of our classes are conveniently offered evenings at our beautiful Southfield campus or online, so you can balance your social, family, and work life even while you power up your career. Lawrence Tech, where blue devils dare.